So it's nice to see uh, like uh, this room full of people. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Jonathan. I am uh, an engineer uh, from the Spring uh, open source team. I usually work on Micrometer. Uh, we are going to talk about that a lot today. Uh, sometimes I also talk uh, or work on Spring Cloud Suite and also talk about it. And when the boot team lets me, I also work on Spring Boot uh, sometimes. So let's talk about observability. But uh, before that, we have a disclaimer. Uh, you might have seen this uh, also if you attended my previous talk. Uh, I'm not doing haikus on this one. Uh, but yeah, it's up there. You can read it. And uh, let's uh, gauge the audience a little bit first. And pun is intended. It was not my pun, but uh, how many people are using any like observability tooling in production? Whoa, OK. You rock. That's, that's great. I, I love seeing this. OK. Uh, how many people are using Spring Boot 3? Not 2, 3. That's, that's awesome. That, that, that's really nice. OK. How many people are using Micrometer? If you are using Spring Boot Actuator, you also has Micrometer. That's pretty good. OK. How about Open Telemetry? Have you heard about it, or have you used it? OK, a few people. Cool. We are going to cover these topics. Uh, but first, let's talk about what is observability. And uh, the interesting thing about observability is that you can get uh, like a different opinions about it, what is it and what is not. So in this talk, we define it kind of like this. Observability is really how well you can understand how something works internally based on the outputs that it provides. So this means that you have a system, it doesn't need to be software. Usually for us, it is software. And it will provide some outputs for you. And from that output, you will have insights about what is going on inside of it. It is kind of also a fancy way of saying data about your application. That's what observability is. But let's also talk about why do we need it, because that is also important. And the one word like answer for, to this question is because of complexity. Because today's systems are insanely complex. We are not living anymore in the LAMP era, where you just had like a Linux Apache uh, web server with a MySQL uh, database running PHP. Uh, not the database, but the web server. Uh, and if something went wrong, what, what could be the root cause? Sometimes they were on the same server. So it wasn't very, very complicated, usually. It could have, but sometimes it wasn't. Uh, that's, that's done. That, that's ended like years ago. We are living in the cloud era nowadays. Uh, if you have heard about the Death Star architecture or Big Ball of Mud, that's what I'm talking about. Also, if you look at that picture, that picture is Amazon's infrastructure 10 plus years ago, maybe closer to 15 than 10 by now. If you imagine, how could that look like today? And if you imagine, if you need to like troubleshoot an issue, then you have this. Yeah, <laughs> good luck. Uh, and just to make it a little bit worse, these environments can be very chaotic. This means that you turn on up here in like in one region and in another region, things can go south and services will go down. Or Somebody will just run a script in US East 1, S3, and your Roomba will not work. That happened a few, day, uh, a few years ago. Uh, also, with this, we need to deal with unknown unknowns. So you can bump issue into issues where you know about them. You know how to tackle them. You know that they can arise. Those are the known uh, things. You can bump into things that you know that you don't know about. Those are the known unknowns, and there are things that can be broken and can bring you your whole production that you don't even know that they are exist. And those are the unknown unknowns, and we need to deal with them, and that's a tall order for observability. Uh, also, things can be perceived differently by different observers. This can mean that, for example, for you, everything seems like 100% OK from your perspective. But at the very same time, maybe everything is down for all of your users. That could definitely happen. Uh, also, there is kind of like a business perspective of this. 
if you are uh, like able to tackle issues and fix them quicker, you will basically minimize losing revenue. So your mean time to recovery uh, can go down so that you can save money. Uh, also, if somebody needs to uh, like troubleshoot something, they don't necessarily need to have like specialized knowledge. Because if they know about these observability tools, if they can use them to ask arbitrary questions about your system, then they don't really need to have this tribal knowledge that only two people uh, like know in your organization. Uh, they should be able to, uh, to do that on their own. And also, you can quantify user experience. You can measure uh, how the users, like uh, what, what is uh, their experience when they use your application. OK, uh, let's do a little demo. Uh, everything that I will show today, that is available on GitHub. Uh, it's open source, you can go there, you can clone it, you can play with it. Uh, the QR code will go to that repo. Uh, if you will not find it, then just go to, you can find me on Twitter or like just like Google my name. If you find my GitHub account, uh, that repo is there, it is called T House. So, uh, well, you know what? Let me talk first about the application before I would, I would demo this. So, Oh, you can do, yes. So this uh, application basically costs like three web services and two databases. The user will call a service called T-Service, which will call out to Water Service and t -Leaf Service, and uh, they have their own databases. That's all, it is that simple. Uh, it is not just one application because I will demo things where you will need more. Uh, so let's try and make some tea. Okay, so this is our award-winning UI. We put a lot, lot, lot of work into this, as you can see. But what you can do here is just, uh, you can select like which tea you want. Let's say I want a small Sencha. And I will get the recipe for this, what, what I need to make this tea. And also let's make like a large English breakfast. When, okay. Uh, that, that's a problem. Uh, do you know what went wrong? I, like, it just say internal server error, but I have no idea why is it. Okay, you know what? Let me try to start my notification server, and maybe I am getting alerts from, from the application. I'm not sure, maybe I'm not. Let me check my emails. I don't get emails either, so maybe alerting is down. But the users are experimenting issues. So let me take to, or let me look at the, the dashboards. So I have a dashboard for the DAPI, and it seems that, see this dashboard? So what you can see here are two graphs. And if I zoom in, one of them says client error, the other one says success right there. And ironically, client error is green. That's not good. Uh, success is yellow. But what you can also tell that this is not happening just for me. This is happening for, like this is an issue for everyone. Like the, this is kind of like last five minutes. If I query like last 30, we have a constant like stream of errors. There are some successes as well, so that's, that's okay, that's fine. But what could like cause this? Let's, let's try to figure out because like this will not tell us what is wrong. It will tell us like how bad is it. It's not very bad, it's kind of like uh, one, like 0 0.5 uh, like requests per second and almost 10. Uh, that's the success. So let's look into the logs first, because that's uh, what a lot of us already have. So if I go to Loki, which is a log ingestion system, and I just query the application, let's say T-Service, and let's not query the last one hour, that's a lot. Let me check just a small section of it. Okay. So here are my logs, and uh, 
I also want to see errors because this says errors but doesn't show them uh, here. So let me also do some errors. Just give me one second because this is not, yes. So I see an error message here. I have a timestamp. I can see that this was an error. This was uh, like an error from the T-service. And I can see that the T-service was trying to call uh, T-leaves endpoint somewhere. And it was 404 and it says resource not found. Okay, so I kind of know like what happened now. I'm still don't really know why did this happen. Just something is wrong and something is not found. Uh, okay, let's uh, try to continue this. And what I would like to demo for you first is how to jump between signals. So we saw logs. Let's try to jump from logs to traces. And you should be able to do this if you have, for example, a Spring Boot 2 or 3 application, or like if you have like uh, these things set up correctly for you, you should be able to do this because the logs should contain the trace ID of a trace. And just to remind uh, like uh, everyone here, uh, if you are doing distributed tracing, there is a thing called a span. A span is basically a operation that you want to measure or observe. And these spans has causal ordering. They have like a parent-child relationship so that you can take and uh, go down cause and you can figure out like why something happened. Now those spans, which are belong together because they like uh, were triggered by one or the other, uh, those are called a trace. And every single span will have a span ID and all of these spans that belong to the same trace, they will have the same trace ID. So if I go back to the logs, where was I? Here. If I go back to the logs, you can see those details here. So this is the service. This is the application. This big number in hex, that's the trace ID. The smaller one is the span ID. And also, if I open this huge, huge, huge log entry, you can see that here as well. Uh, and Grafana or Loki uh, inside of Grafana, it's very uh, like helpful to me because it put a button so that if I click that, then it will open the trace view as well, which is very nice. By the way, what, everything that I will demo today, uh, it's not like you can do it with a bunch of things. It's not just Grafana. I am just using it because it is nice to me giving a button. If that button would not be there, I just copy the trace ID, go to my distributed tracing system like Zipkin, Jaeger, whatever backend you use, and paste it and search it. And that's all. So I am looking at the trace right now. So let's, uh, let's talk about what is this. Here, on the left side, you can see this tree-like structure. This is basically what happened in my app. So this is the call stack, basically. And what you can see next to it is a timeline. Like how much time did this take and how, what is the position of those like, uh, uh, like comparing to each other. So let's drill down. And what I can see here is somebody called the T-service. It was an HTTP get call to this endpoint slash T slash whatever was the name. And the T-service -ser then called out an HTTP get call to the voter service using this endpoint that was an HTTP get call then voter service did a database connection to the voter database, queried the DB, and processed the result set. And that's basically the same thing what happened with the TDF service as well. So there were like two HTTP calls and a bunch of database things. You can also tell from the timeline that the call to the voter service and the T service, that was sequential. It's not parallel. You can see that they are after each other. Uh, it's not an interesting information for us right now, but uh, yeah, you can tell things like this. So you can also see that there is this red uh, like icon, which means it's bad. That was an error. So if I open this span, I can see the very same error that we saw in the logs. And also I can get a lot of other details. Like this was not, not found. And this was the full URL. So this was a not found on the slash t slash English breakfast URL. It was on the T-house, this was a server error, and uh, this was a 500. Okay, 
Uh, that's nice to know, but we still don't know what is broken. I have no idea why my application is showing internal server error. Though, this is way better because now I know it's like 500. And there was like a not fun, like what is going on? Like not fun should be 404, like this doesn't make too much sense. So let's uh, like drill a little bit deeper. And as you can see, there is another red icon here. So I am not sure I care about the water service right now. Let me just close it. And let's look into the tea leaf service. So if I check its tags or attributes, you can see, yeah, resource not found, tea leaf, with name, English breakfast. Resource not found exception. It was a client error 404. So this one is right. This is saying 404 for a not found. But somehow, when this 404 was received by the T service, it mapped to 500. Uh, I don't know why would it happen, but it did. But uh, that's still not our root cause. So let's try to drill more down. Uh, if I check, I can see that there is a database connection here. So based on these details, what I could do, I could log in to that host or the IP. Use that database that you can see in the top row, and uh, I can run the query, which I will show you in the next one. But uh, here, the additional details that you can see that this was a uh, Hickory CP and this MySQL driver. So let's see, let's look into the query here. And the query says, and I am sorry here, I did not write this query. This is Hibernate uh, generated, but it was a select query selecting the name, the amount, and so on, all of these uh, like uh, columns from the tea leaf table where the name of the tea leaf was something. And that's something here you can see that JDBC params is English breakfast. So if uh, I am brave enough, don't do this in production. You can do this in other environment, or if you are adventurous really, then you can go to that host, uh, log into the database, use the database, and run this query and you might get uh, like the same result, what the service did, so maybe that helps. But we have one more thing here, which is the result set. So let's see what we know. Oh, that, that's a problem here. Row count is zero. That's why we are getting a 404. We are trying to query the database. Hey, give me English breakfast. And uh, it's not there, it's not in the DB. So that's why the first service, the TDF service, will get 404, and that 404 will be mapped to 500 by T service, and that's what I'm getting on the UI as internal server error. So why did this happen? Because I intentionally did not put that into the database, but let's put it into it. So uh, this is Passman. I am not able to like zoom in, I'm sorry, but what it is does, it is calling TDF service and it puts English breakfast into the database. So if I send this, and uh, let me stop this because I did not get any uh, alerts either. So now that is, it is in the database, I should be able to press this button and it works. So we were able to basically like drill down and uh, what we see is basically what happened in the logs. We also saw how bad was it from the metrics uh, and we also saw why something happened from the tracing. So hopefully now this should be back to normal. So if I go back and check my dashboard, yeah, do you see that? It is getting back to zero. So hopefully this is, this is good. Let me show you one more thing. Uh, I should go back to these slides. So what we saw is basically going from logs to traces using the trace ID. Nothing prevents you to go the otherwise or the other direction. You can go to the distributed tracing solution. If you have a trace there, if you find a span, just get the trace ID, copy paste, go to the logs and search for that trace ID. And, uh, with Grafana, it's, uh, like it will help us so that we will not need to do uh, the copy-paste. There is a button, look for this span, uh, which is like look for this trace in our case, but uh, yeah, just uh, let me carry on with it. So what you can see here 
is that once I pressed that button, Grafana basically wrote, uh, I teach Grafana like how to write this query. So I am querying uh, the tea house organization and I am just doing a full text search for the trace ID. And what should I see here is basically all of the, all of the error messages that belongs to that trace ID, that contains that, uh, that number. So if I am lucky, I should see kind of the same thing here, what we saw in the trace view in a not as nice uh, like a presentation. And also this can have issues, like this can go out of order. Uh, but theoretically, you can see here that uh, T service called, was called on this endpoint slash T slash English backwards, then it called water service and then called T leaf service. And I guess this is the track trace, yes, the error. So you can get some insights with this as well from the logs if you want. And sometimes it is good to know, good to have this feature, being able to jump not just from log to traces, but the other way as well. So let me show you another thing. Uh, we are going to jump as well. So the next thing I want to show you is that you can jump between traces and metrics as well. It is not as easy as logs, because for logs, you just need the trace ID, and that's all. Jumping from traces to metrics, that's kind of easy. We have a thing called Observation API I will talk about later. What it does, it will basically attach the same keys and values to your metrics and to your trace as well. So when you instrument your code, you will not mess up and you will not like have this issue of like, hey, I am calling this HTTP.status and here is status code or whatever. They will share the same tags. So I teach Grafana how to write uh, like a such query and how to, let me try to go where here. Let me go back to a trace and let me go from there. So I teach Grafana how to write such a query. And I can uh, basically tell Grafana that, hey, I want, let me query 30 minutes. Okay, so for some reason, I will not be able to show you the whole thing because I don't have a graph. I don't know why. Uh, I don't have observability in Grafana, so I'm not able to tell <laughs> what's wrong in Grafana. Uh, but, so what you can see there can I zoom in? Yes. It's basically a query template I wrote. And what Grafana did is got the trace or got the span and substituted that. So the value of method equal or of method, like method equals get, that is coming from the span. So what I can do, I can basically like gather all of these spans that are similar enough and I can basically create a matrix dashboard out of them dynamically, like if I find, find a span, I just like click on it and that's all. You don't need to use Grafana for this, but if you have like, you, you need some automation because maybe you won't, don't want to like copy paste all of these uh, key values uh, into, into your query browser. Okay, so I want to demo maybe one more thing because now the application looks good, uh, right? Do you see anything else that could be wrong? For example, latency. This is latency. What you can see is max TP99 and TP95. And uh, you can see that it was around like 50 or 25-ish milliseconds. The max like was around like 50, went up a little bit to 100 and go back. But now it is at, wow, that's super bad. Uh, first it went up to 200-ish, then we are at four, almost 500. Uh, what happened? Uh, we know that it is bad, we know that it is very bad because of the metrics, but let's check what uh, really happened and why. So, uh, with this, I want to demo how can you go from metrics to traces. And that's a very hard problem to tackle and the Industry just figured that out in the past like few years, and it is called exemplars. Or the answer, or one answer to this question is called exemplars. 
So exemplars are kind of like metadata that you can attach to your metric data points or metric values. And these like metadata that can contain things like span ID and trace ID as well. So when you report that, hey, the latency or the max latency uh, at this time for these tags was, I don't know, 500 milliseconds, you can also tell that, hey, during this time I sampled the traces. And here is the trace ID and the span ID. And if you can do that, and uh, with exemplars you can do this, and this is not, uh, like, there is one caveat here though, because I said in the beginning that you can do this with like basically almost everything. Uh, for this, you should use Prometheus, because right now, I, as far as I know, that is the only backend that uh, like supports exemplars. Uh, so check out if your backend does support it. Uh, right now, I believe Prometheus is the only open uh, solution that, that does this. Uh, Grafana gives a nice support for this, but you can use like plain Prometheus as well. So what I am going to do here, is if I turn this off, see, we have a couple of like graphs here, and there are, oh, there are points in the middle, just like hanging around. Those are the exemplars. Those are basically sampled values. So if I hover over one of them, I can see really like what happened. Let me zoom out a little bit. So this exemplar says that at this time, this uh, like uh, event, it took like 164 milliseconds. And this one on HTTP get, it was success, status is 200, and I have a trace ID. That's great, so I can jump from metrics to trace. So what I'm going to do is basically get a sample from here, copy this trace ID, get a sample from here where this was fast. Oops, please bear with me. Okay, let me click this button. So right now I am seeing a trace where this was fast. Let me split the view, paste the trace ID where this was slow, query it, and hopefully I got a diff view. So you can see on the left that this thing took 35-ish milliseconds. On the right, this other data point, this took 400 and 40 something milliseconds, that's a huge difference. So something is wrong, let's see what it is. You can maybe already tell from the timeline, but let me, uh, let me jump here and uh, zoom in here. So here you can see that this was like 40 uh, or 34, so 35-ish milliseconds because uh, the T-service call uh, to the voter service, it took like 23, and this other one was eight-ish. Okay, how about this? So you can see that this was 400 and something, 440 something, because this was 420 something, and this was 14. So I guess I don't care about this as, like, at all, because out of this 440 something, this 14 is not a big deal. This one, is a big deal. Uh, that's a problem. And why did this happen? You can, you can just uh, like look uh, like, uh, further on the core stack that the voter service, the connection, and the query, it took like 50 something milliseconds. Here it is just uh, 15. And this was like 120 microseconds. Uh, but that's the result set processing, that's fine. Uh, so that's, that, that's, that's a huge difference. And because there are, there are multiple things that are happening through a connection, this can add up. Uh, let's check what else can we see on the dashboard. And uh, let's see the dashboard of which service was this. Let me close this. This was voter service to the voter database. So let's check the dashboard of the voter service if anything else could go wrong. Because right now, we know that my divs, so the issue might be that uh, Either the voter database is slow, or the network between the application and the database is slow. Uh, right now, we cannot really distinguish those two because I don't have instrumentation on the database. That's my SQL. It is not pushing any data to me. So 
what you can do in this case is basically like contact the network guys or the DB admins, and they can check if the database or the network is so. But let's see if there is anything else that uh, we, can, we can look at here. So this is water service. You can see that the heap usage is 55%. That's good. Non-heap is fine. There are not a enormous amount of open files uh, or file descriptors. The CPU, it is sleeping. The load is fine. We are using the G1GC, which is also not doing too much. Uh, that seems good. The non-heap regions are also OK. Uh, we have a bunch of classes loaded, and now it seems unloaded. Uh, but that is not, not a huge issue. We don't really have too much threads. Uh, the GC is not doing too much, and it is fast also. So this seems that it is not really the application. It is really the database. And if I go down to the Hickory CP stats, I should see this bump. And here, yes. That's a problem as well. So this went up. Uh, so it seems that it is the database why this is so. And uh, actually, I can tell in the UI as well. You can see the small like progress uh, animation is popping in. You did not see that before. Uh, why did this happen? I can tell that I am not uh, like connecting to the database directly. I'm connecting to a thing called ToxiProxy. What ToxiProxy can do? It can inject latency. So I injected latency between the database and the, uh, and the application. And if I fix that, then the latency should go back. Uh, and hopefully that will happen. Uh, I am not going to like, uh, watch the, uh, the graph for like another five minutes. So let's uh, carry on. So we saw how to, how to jump from logs to traces and back. We also saw how to jump from traces to metrics and back. Uh, you can use these two to jump from logs to metrics by stopping at the trace. You cannot really jump right now from logs to, to metrics, really. Uh, but it's not, not very hard to do it uh, like using the trace view. So let's talk about how to do these three things uh, in Spring because Spring has uh, like great support for, for all of these things. Uh, these were like Spring applications using actuator and micrometer. So logging is basically about like what happened in the application. You saw that sometimes, uh, or you can also like uh, get some sense of why something happened, because it will tell you, but sometimes it will just say, hey, 500 internal error in your face, and it will not tell you why did that thing happen, but usually you have a good idea about what happened. Metrics, on the other hand, will tell you what's the context of it. Like, if you see an error, uh, is it good or bad? It's not good, because there is an error, but how bad is it? Is it like just one error in the last like, day, or all of the, all of the uh, like requests are failing? Metrics can answer that question. Or logging can tell you that, hey, this uh, operation in your like, access log, it, it take, uh, or it took like 100 milliseconds. Is it good or bad? We, we don't know. It depends. Uh, metrics can tell you that, hey, for example, this 100 millisecond, this is uh, like at the TP99 level. So it's rather bad. Most of the, most of the course was like uh, lower than this. And let's say the maximum was 110. In that context, it's not good. Uh, and this is with the tracing, the third one. It should tell you why something happened. Like what you, what you saw. It is able to record events with causal ordering so that you know which event or which span caused by what? Like, why did I end up this error? Because you had like five, I don't know, service calls and the database call and the database call failed. Or you can like see that, hey, this whole thing took 500 milliseconds because you have like five calls and at the end the database was slow or the network or like another service, whatever. So let's talk a little bit about logging. How can you do logging with Spring? If you are using Spring Boot, then uh, Spring Boot comes with SLF4J and Logback pre-configured. SLF4J stands for Simple Logging Facade for Java. And it's kind of like a, it has a simple API. 
And the idea is basically you can plug logging libraries in and out. Uh, Logback is a library that you can plug into SLF4J and it natively implements the SLF4J API. And uh, if you want to use uh, Log4J instead of Logback, you just need to like, remove a dependency or exclude a dependency and include another one, the Log4J one, uh, or the Log4J2 one. So let's move on to metrics. What you can do if you want to implement metrics using Spring? And the answer for that is usually Micrometer. Micrometer is a dimensional metrics library on the JVM. Uh, we like to say that it's like SLF4J, but for metrics. There are a subtle difference I will tell you a little bit about on the next slide. Uh, but we are uh, usually like, like to say this because uh, Micrometer gives you an API which is independent from the backend. What you can do if you instrument your code with Micrometer, you can replace your backend. Like one time you are using Prometheus, then you are moving it to StatsD or Datadog or New Relic or you name it. Uh, and you are using the same API and you don't need to change the instrumentation. Or you can use multiple backends at the same time, if you will. Uh, Spring Boot Actuator uh, like brings in Micrometer for you and it is auto-configuring it uh, for you. So you are getting it for like free if you are using Actuator. Uh, and Spring projects are instrumented using Micrometer. Most of the Spring portfolio is using Micrometer to instrument itself. And there are many, many third-party libraries. The list is like very long that are using Micrometer uh, to instrument themselves because Micrometer is like a standalone library. It doesn't depend on Spring. You can instrument like any JVM application using it. So when we say it is like SLF4J but for metrics, this is kind of what we think about. These are the metrics backends that we support. Or maybe saying metrics backends is not the best because these are the line protocols or the wire formats that we support. Because, for example, the Prometheus format is supported by multiple backends, not just Prometheus. Uh, also, the same thing for the open telemetry line protocol. OTLP is supported by multiple backends as well. So the list is much longer than this. Uh, but if you have a backend micrometer, it's a good chance that micrometer has support for that. Uh, cool. Let's jump on to distributed tracing with Spring. Like what you should do if you want distributed tracing and you are using Spring. And we need to make a little bit of a dis we need to distinguish these a little bit if you are using Spring Boot 2 or 3. If you are using Spring Boot 2, I hope it is 2.7 because that is the, uh, the latest version that right now it is supported uh, and it will end of life in November. So right now, if you're using boot two, uh, then the answer for that is Spring Cloud Sleuth. Spring Cloud Sleuth is the distributed tracing, tracing support for Spring Framework 5 and boot two applications. But if you are already in Spring Boot 3, then first, thumbs up for you. Second, you should use micrometer tracing in that case. And micrometer tracing is kind of like a continuation of Sleuth. I was, uh, I was in this very venue last October on Java 1, and somebody was asking me that, hey, why did you write another distributed tracing library? Like, why do you have a new library called Micrometer Tracing? Why wasn't good enough what you had already there? And the answer to that is because Micrometer Tracing is not new and it's not a, li not a tracing library. Micrometer Tracing was started in 2015. It was called Spring Cloud Sleuth. What we did is basically copied Sleuth over under the micrometer umbrella and basically like rename the package, uh, remove the spring dependencies so you can use micrometer tracing in non-spring apps as well. You just need a JVM uh, based app. And uh, we fixed a couple of things and moved things around uh, so that it will be better. So micrometer tracing is really Sleuth. And it is not a tracing library because we have kind of like a SLF4J situation here. Micrometer tracing is an abstraction over tracing libraries so that you can plug tracing libraries in and out. The default that we usually recommend, it is called Brave from the OpenZipkin community. And Brave is a mature project. Uh, it is there for like long, long years. And there is also OpenTelemetry, which is kind of like an experimental uh, like support right now because OpenTelemetry is not stable yet. And open telemetry uh, is uh, under the CNCF umbrella. So, 
these projects, like uh, the projects under the Spring portfolio, these are, they are also like, because they are using the Micrometer API, they're also using Micrometer Tracing to instrument themselves. And uh, we have support for various backends because these two tracing libraries that we support, they have support for very various backends too. So uh, this might be the most important part of the whole talk, the observation API. So in 2000, so last year, November, we released Micrometer 1.10. And 1.10 came with a new thing, a new set of API called the Observation API. And the idea behind the Observation API was that you might want to instrument your application, your code base, your business logic, your components, whatever. If you want metrics, let's say you want tracing and maybe logs, then you need to instrument this multiple times. Like you want to like emit like log messages, you want to start and stop a timer, increment a counter, you want to start and stop a span, a signal and error, whatever. So if you just do like metrics and tracing, you already need to instrument your application at least twice. That's a lot of boilerplate for, for the same thing basically. So what we did, we came up with one API where you don't necessarily need to tell what should happen, you are just trying to tell what you want to observe. So you're not starting and stopping timers and spans anymore. You can say that, hey, let me start an observation and let me stop that observation when I'm done. Let me also signal an error. And what should happen with the data? That's basically up to you because the kind of like the heart of this observation API, it is called the observation handler. And in these handlers, you can basically receive notifications when somebody started an observation or stopped an observation. So we have a default meter handler. If you use that, it will start and stop a timer for you. We have a default tracing handler. If you use that, it will start and stop a span for you. Uh, also, you can write a logging handler if you want. We have something like that. I am not uh, like I recommend it in production. You can do your own thing. Or let's say that you want to like write an event into an audit table in, and to an audit database. You can write a handler for that as well and you don't need to touch your instrumentation. Even better, if you have like third party instrumentation that are using the observation API and there are like many that's already started or already done this, then you can just say that, hey, if something happens in this HTTP client that I'm, I use, I'm using and I don't need to instrument it because it is already instrumented, I can just like plug these in and out and get the data and process the data however I please, which is kind of cool. Uh, we also have a couple of like shortcuts. So there is uh, like an observation that you just create, not start it, and you just say, hey, observe this method. And there is a method uh, reference that you can just plug in and this will do the start and stop and signaling an error and a bunch of other things. Or you can also say at observed, that's an annotation. If you put that on a method, it will do the same thing. So uh, that's basically the observation API. And uh, let's talk a little bit about what will happen in Micrometer later this year, maybe next year. So we are, uh, we, we will uh, release improved exemplar support. Right now, like uh, older versions of Prometheus, they did not support exemplars everywhere. We talked to them, opened an issue, opened a pull request, they merged it, released it, and now it's good. So we are giving you more like uh, exemplars. So you will get that for more time series. Uh, if you haven't using exemplars, it doesn't make too much sense to you. But if you are already using exemplars, this is a huge win. Uh, and Prometheus is now able to do that. Uh, also, we have a lot of observability improvements in the Spring portfolio, uh, mostly in context propagation uh, with Reactor because that's a nightmare. And also we have like additional instrumentation and we are in investigating how to do this with virtual threads because that can be interesting. It will be released in Java 21 in September. And also, I mean the virtual threads, not the micrometer support. We are just investigating it. I don't know what will happen with that. And also, we are also investigating coordinated restore and checkpoint uh, feature as well, which should be uh, like available in one of the future versions of the JDK 2. 
And maybe we will have a new doc site, hopefully. Fingers crossed. So uh, please follow me and Tommy as well. Uh, this talk should have been done by the two of us, but he wasn't able to be here. But please follow him in on, on Twitter uh, and uh, also me as well if you want. Also, you can visit us on Slack. And thank you very much for listening.